In this video, I want to talk about conservation of momentum. In advanced problem solving, it's all about the conserved quantities. Everything that you can find that's conserved is a very powerful tool that you have in solving complex problems. And so now we want to talk about one of the most important conservation relationships, which is the conservation of momentum. And you'll find it's a bit like Newton's second law in that it's really pretty easy to write down, but the application of it to a wide variety of problems takes quite a bit of practice. Okay, so, but first, let's talk for a minute about a system of particles. So, let's say I, so I, I'm not just going to have uh, one particle this time, I've got a set of them. Let's say I have uh, n particles. If I have n particles, then I can define the total momentum, p t sub tot to tell me that's the total momentum, is the vector sum i of 1 to n of all the momenta of all the individual particles. So this is the momentum of particle 1 plus the momentum of particle 2 plus the momentum of particle 3 dot 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 till I get to the last particle. Okay, so that's my system of particles and I can define my total momentum. Okay, so now assume Oh, I'm going to put this in red. No, I'm going to even capitalize it. No net force on system. No net force on system. So it's not on each particle, but the no, no, there's no net uh, force on the system of particles. Okay, in this case, then, we have the conservation of momentum, which says our total momentum is a constant. And that's it. As long as you have no net force on the system, this quantity, which is the sum, the vector sum of all the individual momenta, is a constant. So, and, and that's it. <laughs> the rest is applying that particular statement to a bewildering array of physics problems. Okay, so let's talk about how is this useful and, and let's do a simple example. So you remember when we did kinematics and we had these constant acceleration equations and we said if you could identify two points in time between which there was constant acceleration then you could apply these constant acceleration relationships. And so we'll think about it in the same way. Let's say I have a system of particles and I can identify two points in time say at a t initial and a t final. And between these two points in time there is no net not external force, but either way, no net force on the system. Okay. And if that's true, then you can say that the initial, and so uh, total initial momentum is equal to the total final momentum. And so this gives us a relationship between all the individual momenta at one point in time to all the individual momenta at another point in time. And then this relationship might allow us to, this, this vector equation gives us ideas of, of relating all those parameters together that might allow us to uh, get information. And so let's do a simple example and see how this might be powerful. Okay. So I'm going to start with uh, two objects that are in contact with each other 
and then something happens. I don't know what it is. Maybe there's an explosion. One of them is uh, um, uh, volatile. And so we'll call this A and B. And then after something happens, B shoots off one way and A shoots off the other way. Okay. What can we say about the relative velocities of these two objects? Well, let's say that uh, if these two were, say, uh, sitting on a frictionless surface, then call this a fr frictionless surface, then their normal force were equal to the gravitational forces on them. So this is my system. Let me, my system of these two objects that initially before this explosion and initially after this explosion there was no net force on the system. They were exerting forces on each other but uh, those were equal in, in uh, magnitude opposite direction so there was no net force on the system. That means there's no net external force on the system because all the internal forces cancel because of Newton's third law. But So there's no net external force on the system immediately after before and immediately after this explosion so let's let's identify those as our two points in time and see what uh, our conservation of momentum gives us first though we need to give ourselves a, a coordinate system always always coordinate system and so I'm going to say this positive x direction is off to the right I can set zero here to be if I want the sort of the point where the two particles are at rest, initially sitting together. Okay, so before, what are the momenta of my particle particles? The momentum of uh, A is uh, zero because it's at rest. The momentum of B is zero, so the total initial momentum zero. Okay, well that was straightforward. So let's look at then immediately after and and now what? Okay, so the momentum of A I'll give it a, a vector here. I didn't get my that has a vector too. My momentum of A is the mass of A times the velocity of A, well it's the speed of A, and so it's in the positive x direction, so I'm going to call this a positive values, my mass is a positive, and my v sub A I'm going to call my speed, so this is positive. Okay, my momentum of B then is equal to the mass of B times the velocity of B, it's along the x direction, but of course it's going in the negative x direction, so it's minus. And so the sum of these is our total momentum final, which is equal to m a v sub a minus m b v sub b. I'm running out of room here. I hat. Okay. And so what I know is that between these two points in time there is no net external force so that tells me that this is equal to this well if those two are equal then m a mass of a times the speed of a minus the mass of b times the speed of b must be equal to zero and that says the mass of a times the velocity of a is equal to the mass of b times the velocity of b and so depending what I know then is uh, I could solve say the velocity of B then is related to the velocity of A given uh, proportional to the ratio of the masses right so velocity of B is equal to the velo is proportional to the velocity of A by the the ratio of the masses depending on 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 uh, what information I have and and what information I need okay so 
we can sort of see this if we just look at it sort of in our in our vector form we know that up here our our initial system p total is zero because everything's zero and then after the explosion there was p sub a in that direction and p sub b in that direction and we know that these two vectors had to equal zero if this is the vector piece uh, momentum of a this is the vector of the momentum b if i just think of this you know adding vectors graphically i know that the sum of these two vectors has to equal zero so that tells me that the vector of b is equal to the negative the vector of a and in fact if we compare it to what we had before we see that is exactly right now remember when I went here I, I made those speeds positive numbers so I could explicitly take care of the minus sign here so I have to be careful talking about uh, velocities and speeds but as we can see looking at it graphically the momentum of B is equal to the opposite of momentum of A which is what we saw exactly looking at it in component form as well okay so sometimes it's convenient uh, to look at these graphically especially if you look have in two dimensions sometimes you can um, uh, it's easier to solve the problem using vectors graphically sometimes it's best just to break it into component form as we did here um, so the one thing I want to highlight about this method is that we were able to extract relationships between the speeds of our quantities and if we knew one we'd be able to calculate the other we'd be able to uh, evaluate the motion of this system and we would be able to calculate the result of what happened without ever knowing what the force was and that's why this is so important prior to the momentum we were dealing with forces the forces were everything we had to understand the net force on an object to be able to calculate what happened but as but here's a case where if we can use conservation of momentum we can in fact calculate what's going to happen and predict what's going to happen with the system without ever knowing anything about the forces and that's one of the things that makes conservation of momentum so powerful in solving problems.